Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, ever merciful. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon you, dear viewers. Welcome to tonight's live online lecture organized by the UK Dalim or Education Department. As per our tradition, we will start with the recitation of the Holy Quran. If I could please request Salahuddin Mir Sahib to recite a portion. <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ليس عليك هداهم ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء وما تنفقوا من خير فلأنفسكم وما تنفقون إلا ابتغاء وجه الله وما تنفقوا من خير يوفى إليكم وأنتم لا تزلمون للفقراء الذين أفسروا في سبيل الله لا يستطيعون ضربا في الأرض يحسبهم الجاهل أغنياء من التعفف تعرفهم بسيماهم لا يسألون الناس إلهافا وما تنفقوا من خير فإن الله به عليم Translation The verses that I have recited right now is are from Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verses 273 and 274 It is not thy responsibility to make them follow the right path but Allah guides whomsoever he pleases. And whatever of wealth you spend, the benefit of the benefit of it will be for yourselves, for you spend not but to seek the favor of Allah. And whatever wealth and whatever of wealth you spend, it shall be paid back to you in full, and you shall not be wronged. Arms are for the poor who are detained in the way of Allah and are unable to move about in the land. The ignorant man imagines them to be free from want because of their abstaining from begging. Thou shalt know them by their appearance. They do not beg of man with importunity. And whatever of wealth you spend, surely Allah has perfect knowledge thereof. Jazakallah. This evening we have the pleasure of having with us Dr. Aziz Ahmed Hafiz Sahib who is currently serving as Chairman of Humanity First UK. By profession, Aziz Sahib is a GP trainer with a specialist interest in palliative care and medical education. He has over 15 years experience as a GP in Yorkshire and is lead educator at his practice, specializing in consultation skills for medical students at the University of Leeds Medical School. He has served Humanity First since its inception in 2005, initially as a disaster responder for the charity during the Balkans crisis in the 1990s, where he witnessed firsthand the humanitarian impact on people, especially children. Over the years, he has been on deployment with Humanity First in Ghana and Uganda, working with vulnerable people with limited access to healthcare. He has led on a number of humanitarian and natural disasters including the Rohingya crisis, Hurricane Matthew in Haiti, and the Palu earthquake in Indonesia. Aziz Sahib has also personally led disaster response teams on the ground in Nepal, Nepal during the 2015 earthquake, as well as in the occupied Palestinian territories and in Iraq recently. Currently, Aziz Sahib leads Humanity First's fight against COVID-19, coordinating emergency relief work around the world in developing countries, as well as ensuring long-term actions to fight the virus. In January of this year, he returned from visiting our operations in a number of countries in West Africa, where as well as meeting our volunteers and government ministers, he also conducted medical outreach camps in remote villages, seeing over 200 patients each day. Aziz Sahib regularly advocates for humanitarian action on behalf of Humanity First, at various international institutions, including the United Nations Humanitarian Response Depot and the World Health Organization. So who better then to speak on tonight's topic of faith and 
As always, there will be an opportunity for you, the viewers, to ask questions. These will be put to Aziz Sahib on your behalf in the last 15 minutes of tonight's session. Please type your questions into the live chat and kindly ensure that they are relevant to tonight's topic. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce and hand over to respected Aziz Hafiz Sahib. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessings of God Almighty be upon you all. Um, Divakar Sahib and viewers, thank you very much for having me on today. So without further ado, uh, I've been asked to share some thoughts about the topic of faith and altruism. Uh, I'll just share my screen. If you bear with me. Hopefully, you can all see that. So, let's start by saying what is altruism? So, altruism is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as a selfless concern for the well being of others. The Promised Messiah, Islam, the founder of the Amdiya Muslim community, spoke and written at length about altruism uh, most famously in the book the philosophy of the teachings of islam where he comments on one of the verses of the holy quran chapter 16 verse 91 which states verily allah enjoys justice and the doing of good to others and giving like kindred and forbids indecency and manifest evil and wrongful transgression so this, this verse is the link between what altruism means to humanity first and how it is linked uh, to faith. The Prophet Messiah has discussed two parts of faith. One is, is to love God, the creator. And number two is to love his creation. Now, in the writings of the Promised Messiah, in the philosophy of the teachings of Islam, the verse, chapter 16, verse 91, uh, the Promised Messiah Islam talks of three types of good. Uh, so three types of uh, good works, if we talk about altruism. The first is the basic level of doing good in return for somebody else doing good. And the second type is a benevolent type of good. Uh, where you, you take the initiative and do good with a, an internal desire maybe to receive some gratitude. And the third or the ultimate five-star level of good, it is doing good for, for no reward. And God Almighty has referred to the Holy Prophet of Islam, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, has a mercy for mankind. In the Holy Quran he states, uh, and we have sent thee not, O Muhammad, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, but as a mercy for all peoples. The founder of the Amdiya Muslim community, when he described altruism, he states, my desire, my wish, my objective is serving humanity. It is my job, my faith, and my way. So that gives you a, a bit of an introduction from the Amdiya Muslim community's perspective, the, and how Humanity First is integrally linked to that. Now, if we look towards the scientific basis of altruism, only this weekend at one of the Humanity First's academic lectures, Professor Jeremy Howick from the University of Oxford discussed the scientific basis of altruism. And he cited a paper, a very famous paper written in the early 1980s called The Evolution of Cooperation. And it's a paper written by a US political scientist called Robert Axelrod and a British uh, evolutionary biologist, uh, William Hamilton. So they both discussed at great length about uh, why the human race is altruistic, the genetics of that, uh, and the confusion that sometimes scientists may have that why would it be uh, uh, a preferential instinct to be altruistic? Because if you look in the in the early days where people were gather hunter hunters, if you are doing good to other, you're spending time doing well for somebody else. You are then by definition spending less time hunting, less time reproducing, 
therefore, uh, in terms of natural selection, you are putting yourself at a disadvantage. Uh, so they discuss this uh, at great length uh, and in the end come to a conclusion that uh, actually ultimately it is a, a source of good and it's a source of progression uh, for humanity. I now want to go on to, so that was what is altruism, I want to go on to describe to you that with this altruistic vision how Humanity First as an international NGO was created by the fourth caliph of the Amdiya Muslim community. And in the early 1990s, there was a crisis in Somalia. Uh, there was a civil war and there was a deep desire uh, for the caliph of the Amdiya Muslim community to help serve. Uh, and there were some challenges. And I'm going to play to you an, an Urdu clip where he describes in his own words. So bear with me. इसके अलावा तमाम बड़े बड़े बुकों में नवाज इंडिया को ज्यादा देना चाहिए कि जिस तरह रेड क्रॉस वाला इंटरनेशनल सोसाइटी है उस तरह अगर मजबूत सोसाइटी में एक मेहनत अफवानी हैसियत से परेशानी और जानी जाए और उनका एक मकान कायम कर सकता हो तो नवाज इंडिया को अब वक्त आ गया है कि अपनी आजाद सोसाइटी बनानी चाहिए So, basically, the fourth caliph of the Amdiya Muslim community is saying there that addressing the Amdiya Muslim community, saying like the Red Cross and other religious institutions that have NGOs, the Amdiya Muslim community should also look, so this is speaking in the early 90s, should also look at establishing its own NGO that would work on the basis, the ethos of the Amdiya Muslim community, which is serving with the fear of God and with justice, irrespective of race, religion, colour. And people of all walks of life should join that. Uh, uh, and he mentions there that there are many other religious bodies, Christian institutions that also have permission and that we should search uh, to be able to create such an institution and funds should be collected from, from all people uh, and they should serve. Uh, and he prays that may God grant the community the ability to do that. So this was the starting of Humanity First. Now, I'm going to quickly go on to some expectations. So the, the Promised Messiah al Islam has given some expectations about humanitarian service. And the current Caliph of the Amdiya Muslim community, His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, may Allah be his helper, at a conference in 2015, uh, elucidated a little bit further on these. And I will just play a very quick clip uh, in his own words as to what those expectations were. On countless occasions, the Prophet al Islam spoke or wrote about the need to serve humanity. In this regard, his expectations were truly vast. And this is proved by the fact that he made serving humanity a condition of prayer, which has already been read by ISR. But I again read the ninth condition of prayer reads as follows that he or she shall keep himself or herself occupied in the service 
of God's creatures. For his sake only, and shall endeavor towards the beneficence of mankind to the best of his or her God given abilities and powers. So that gives you the, the basics the basics of why uh, we should serve. But he then goes on to, in this conference, in this Humanity First conference, uh, His Holiness Nazim Zamsurim goes on to talk about some of the skills that he expects from the volunteers, uh, from the humanitarians. And those skills are essentially, as he will go on in his own words, that they not only seek assistance from their own skills, whether they're a doctor and an engineer, a mechanic, a project manager, but they rely on assistance from God Almighty, uh, and that assistance is what blesses uh, their work. And so, here the Prophet Messiah has now has mentioned a beautiful, distinguishing feature of the members of the Amdiya Muslim community, rarely seen elsewhere, that where they seek to serve others, they do not rely only on their wealth or skills alone. Rather, along with their physical efforts, they bow down in sincere prayer, seeking Allah's help and assistance. The prayer Allah enables them to serve with the true spirit of sympathy, compassion, and love for mankind. They seek Allah's help to develop a truly selfless spirit, whereby they consider the pain and desperation of others as their own pain and desperation. They pray that they are able to remove the tribulations and suffering of other people. Now, you, you've heard directly from the, the Caliph of the Amdiya community uh, and from the Prophet Messiah in terms of those expectations. Now, the talk is about faith and, and altruism. So, altruism needs some, there are some skill sets required there. And the scientists have, have looked at that. And this community has also looked at that. And the next clip I'm going to play actually looks at those skill sets. What is the JDE? What is the job description that's required for a humanitarian? Uh, and again, I will share with you a very quick clip that looks at that skill set. What is the skill set that's required to be an altruistic humanitarian? Always remember, the Prophet Islam taught his followers that one type of work that is devoting one's life or time for the sake of Allah is to serve God's creation and show love towards them. This requires true selflessness and love for others. It requires that a person does not rest until he has solved the problems of others and takes the weight of their burdens onto his own shoulders. It requires that a person's heart is consumed by love for others, whereby he cares not for his own comfort, but rather he cares only for the comfort of others. It requires that the person is ever ready to personally absorb all forms of distress for the sake of others, to consider the pain of others as though it is his own pain. 
It requires that a person is ready to bear personal suffering or anxiety so that others can live in peace and contentment. So that's given you a brief description of the skill sets. Now I'm going to share with you some of the practical implementation of that skill set that Humanity First has been blessed and by God's grace uh, been, been able to try to uh, implement. So I'm going to go over some of the scope of, of Humanity First and some of the work that it, that it does. Uh, essentially, Humanity First covers three areas, development, disaster relief and thought leadership. In the area of development, it establishes schools, clinics, vocational training centers, orphanages, water provision and food security in, in less well-off parts of the world. From a disaster relief point of view, Currently, you see with the COVID pandemic, uh, and I'll go on to talk about that uh, a little bit later, it there assists in natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, as well as unfortunately man-made disasters where we've seen many refugee crises from the Middle East to parts of Africa uh, that sadly uh, we are riddled with at the moment. And one of the final areas that it looks at is the area of thought leadership which is essentially bringing to the fore the, the knowledge, bringing to the public uh, the cutting edge discussion amongst fellow colleagues and humanitarians and the wider world about the leading areas within the humanitarian work. And in this regard, recently, uh, I alluded to earlier, we've had award-winning Professor Howick from Oxford University discussing well-being during the COVID crisis uh, and also previously Dr Hugo Slim formerly of the International Red Cross now Oxford University talking about the ethics uh, within conflict and particularly the ethics uh, humanitarian ethics during the, the global pandemic and fulfilling this altruism the members of Humanity First, look to engage with other parts of society, the, the UN, UN portals, the WHO, other NGOs, and advocate good works and share experiences between other organizations so that together, in a unified way, we can come together uh, and, and help and, and help humanity. And this has worked with uh, military coordination with the Dutch Navy in Haiti, with our colleagues from Humanity First Canada. It's also led to work with the World Food Programme, which is currently being done by our partners, Humanity First Germany. So there's a whole scope of unified working across the world, but with the training and with the teaching uh, that has been given to Humanity First, that core skills that it has learned uh, from following the guidance from respective caliphs of the Ambia Muslim community uh, to implement its humanitarian uh, work ethic. I'm now going to share with you, again, just to uh, put some semblance of practicality uh, into them, some of the areas where work has been carrying out. Here you can see the volunteers of Humanity First working in Ecuador. This uh, these are the Canadians and our British colleagues trying to assist following the 2016 Ecuadorian earthquake. And here you've got villages that have no access to water. And here one of the volunteers is, is training them how to use a temporary water pump to provide them clean water. Here is an example of coordination working with the Royal Dutch Navy, as I alluded to earlier. This is in Hurricane Matthew in Haiti where our colleagues from Humanity First Canada and the United States uh, joined together to help reach parts of Western Haiti that were not reached uh, by others uh, for a significant length of time. But again, working in coordination with, with, with others. This sadly, parts of the Middle East where war and conflict uh, is leading to 
a lot of strife for many, many people. Refugees, particularly from the Syrian crisis, uh, are now spread in varying parts. Uh, they are being sheltered in countries such as Turkey, Germany, uh, and Canada. We talked about man-made conflict, and sadly there are many, many wars in the world where children, particularly in the Middle East, are, are suffering and acutely suffering with malnutrition due to lack of access to food, with no access to water, and no access to, to medicine. And it's in areas like this that humanity first tries uh, to reach uh, and tries to provide food, water, and medicine. Uh, to play its part within the global humanitarian effort. Again, this is a refugee camp where there are children uh, within Iraq who've escaped the, the, the clutches of Daesh. Uh, and again, very happy children who've just received some new clothes uh, and have come to play in their new football ground that has been built uh, for them uh, by uh, another organization. Again, another refugee camp here, sadly, in Iraq. Uh, and it, it was shocking as we walked through that refugee camp. Uh, children, many of these children have no parents, have lost their mothers, lost their fathers, uh, and yet still with a smile on their face, tried to battle through, tried to battle through uh, and look to a brighter day, uh, a brighter future. Again, sadly, in Iraq, here is the city of Mosul, when as we walked through, uh, you could feel and smell, sadly, the death and destruction uh, that man has wreaked uh, upon his fellow man. And in many cases, uh, wrongfully in the name of religion. Uh, and this again is a city uh, that was ravaged uh, during the battles uh, for the liberation of Mosul from the clutches of uh, Daesh or the Islamic State. And here you can see what previously were shops and stores now left damaged in rubble. And this was a vibrant, vibrant city. Here you can see Humanity First working in one of the biggest refugee crises in the world. This is in the Kutaplan camp in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. Uh, and this is uh, our Amir and head of the Amdiya Muslim community, Bangladesh, uh, working on the shop floor with Humanity First, serving food provisions uh, for the many, many thousands. In fact, there are over 800,000 refugees that have escaped uh, the troubles uh, from across the border in Myanmar. Again, this is another example going back to the city of Mosul where you can see the war has left destruction uh, and rubbish lying everywhere. I'll just share with you. Sorry, my apologies. Um, my screen is... Fix my technology. I think my technology is misbehaving, so you'll have to bear with me. Let's start through. So bear with me as we flick through these slides again. That gives you an example of some of the areas of work across the world. And whilst I try to fix my slides, uh, I'm now going to go to share with you some of the work. Again, apologies for the, the IT failures. In the crisis that we're currently facing, which is the global pandemic of COVID, sadly, you've seen millions and millions of cases of coronavirus uh, and nearly half a million deaths. Uh, Humanity First across 
more than 50 branches of Humanity First has been serving in over 70 countries uh, currently. And to give you again some practical example of the implementation of their altruistic, altruistic vision, uh, they have been serving over 180,000 uh, personal protective equipments. They've supported 148 hospitals. They've donated over 2,000 units of blood, mainly from our community within Indonesia. They've provided over 8 million meals for people, not only in Africa and Southeast Asia, but in the Americas as well, where the United States sadly is, uh, is, is, is suffering quite heavily. And in total, we've had nearly three and a half thousand volunteers that have been putting this effort together. And together, they have served over 650,000 uh, beneficiaries. And if you look at this collective effort, because they are all working as volunteers, they have been able to save over five million US dollars in costs uh, due to the fact that all the experts uh, that we are using and the volunteers are, are unpaid uh, volunteers. And with reference to the unpaid volunteers and with reference to the work that these volunteers do, I'm going to share with you again some words of His Holiness Azamizam Suremand uh, on some of this work. تعلیم علاج اور دوسرے کام جیسے زلزلوں اور طوفانوں وغیرہ میں ہنگامی کام کرنا شامل ہے ہیومینٹی فرسٹ میں بھی جماعت کے افراد ایک جذبے سے کام کرتے ہیں اور وہی کام جو دوسری تنظیمیں ہیں لاکھوں میں خرچ خرچ کر لاکھوں خرچ کر کے کرتی ہیں یہ ہزاروں میں کر دیتے ہیں ہمارے والنٹیئر بن جاتے ہیں بس ایک حصہ جماعت کا مالی لحاظ سے بھی اور افرادی قوت کے لحاظ سے بھی رضاکانہ طور پر اپنی خدمات پیش کر کے یہ کام کرتے ہیں دوسروں کو بھی چاہیے بہت سے ایسے ہیں جو اس کار خیر میں سمجھ لیتے ہیں ان کو بھی چاہیے کہ جیسا کہ میں نے کہا اپنی خوشی کے موقع پر ایک نئے کاموں میں اللہ تعالیٰ کی رضا کے لیے حصہ لیں اور حقیقت میں اس سے جو خوشی آپ کو اس کی عادت پڑ جانے کے بعد ہوگی وہ ان عارضی خوشیوں سے کہیں زیادہ ہوگی سو اگین gives you uh, an example of where, how the volunteer effort uh, is actually put into practice. Uh, unfortunately, my screen is misbehaving, uh, so you have to bear with me. So I'm now going to share with you some of the incidents uh, that many of our volunteers have seen. Uh, I'm going to title this next section, uh, The Face of God. The promised Messiah, the peace and blessings of God Almighty be upon him, in one of his poems uh, has stated in one of his Urdu couplets that these are the days of seeing the face of his beloved, referring to God Almighty. And in a lot of this humanitarian work, there not a day goes by when our volunteers from across the world are able to see real life evidence of the, the existence of God and are able to see with their own eyes and their own ears uh, the help and the sustenance that God Almighty gives them not only in their work but in those beneficiaries that they're trying to help. Interestingly, there is a book with the title The Face of God written by Roger Scruton who writes about the need for God Almighty 
uh, in our sort of atheistic uh, times. So I'm going to share with you some of the anecdotes that our volunteers have seen and witnessed with their own eyes. I'm going to share with you a personal example first. In 2015, many will remember that there was a huge earthquake in, in Nepal on the 25th of April. Humanity First took a team of over 17 clinicians following that first earthquake to try to assist in the Gorkha region of, of Nepal. Following that initial team, uh, I was fortunate enough uh, to visit Nepal on a second uh, mission. And whilst we were there, a very frightening and yet faith-inspiring incident happened. Uh, the day, we remember it very well, was the 12th of May in the morning, 8 o'clock. The plan was to visit the Home Minister, who would be the Home Secretary. And we should have left the house at about 7 or 8 o'clock. But for varying delays, uh, we were delayed. And I think we were delayed by three to four hours, uh, I suspect. Uh, and there was a degree of frustration on my part that you know, this is not the, the GMT timing that, that I'm used to. Uh, but uh, in the spirit of obedience uh, with our hosts, uh, we, we continued understanding it's a disaster situation. As we reached the Home Minister, uh, we, we met their officials. And uh, the, the formalities and the meeting concluded. Uh, but we were very, very late. The reason being is that we had to be at a location uh, called uh, Sindhupal Chok uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, and we were three, four hours behind. So the, the whole day's plan had, had, really, uh, had really fallen apart. So as we were driving through Kathmandu, uh, and I remember the time very clearly, it was approximately one o'clock, and exactly 12.50, the car that was sat in the back suddenly started shaking. And I'd assumed that it was swerving to avoid a dog or an animal on the road. But what we were actually feeling, we were feeling the 7.3 magnitude second earthquake, large aftershock that happened on the 12th of May at 12.50. Uh, and by God's grace, uh, the, we, we were saved and we came to no harm. But it transpired that we now could not continue our journey to where we needed to be. And it, then we were told by uh, our local administration of the Amdiya Muslim community in Nepal that had we set off on time, had everything gone according to plan, at the point that earthquake had happened, we would have been in the village of Sindhupal Chok and the area had been completely destroyed. So we were, we were left... Uh, sort of prostrate at God Almighty's favours that how he had protected us uh, from, from near guaranteed, guaranteed death. And the shock that we felt, uh, felt huge. And people in Chennai, in India, 1,500 miles away could feel the shock. That's how powerful uh, that, that shock was. Again, our volunteers have witnessed across West Africa in the occupied territories in Palestine, in the Balkans, in Gambia, in Ghana, living examples of how people are assisted uh, and how they are helped. Medical camps where medicines that you would not have hoped to have actually made any benefit because you had no choice uh, but uh, to give them something potentially that was not as strong as what you would like, but giving revolutionary benefit. Uh, an unbelievable benefit uh, to uh, those patients. So I've shared with you, or I've tried to share with you, the time is, is, is rapidly concluding, uh, the work that Humanity First does, how it links to the recognition of God Almighty, and how it links to the love of the creation of God Almighty. I'm going to share with you another video which summarizes this. Again, it is an, uh, it is an, an Urdu poem uh, which gives you some background about how under the leadership of Caliphate, Humanity First is able to reach 
uh, parts of the world. Some funds were raised entirely for the sake of helping the suffering humanity. I decided to spend out that money on the poor people and that is exactly what we are doing. Not only in one country, but in Ghana, in Nigeria, where are the people suffering. Moreover, we had means of helping people with human sacrifice, which coupled with the legal financial forces makes a sizable uh, contribution. But without that human sacrifice, that small contribution financially would not mean anything. Now, our experience tells us that if we spend money ourselves for a good cause, the result is ten times more satisfactory. Serve God's creation and show love towards them. This requires true selflessness and love for others. It requires that a person does not rest until he has solved the problems of others and takes the weight of their burdens onto his own shoulders. It requires that the person's heart is consumed by love for others, whereby he cares not for his own comfort, but rather he cares only for the comfort of others. It requires that the person is ever ready to personally absorb all forms of distress for the sake of others, to consider the pain of others as though it is his own pain. It requires that the person is ready to bear personal suffering or anxiety so that others can live in peace and contentment. <laughs> I'll now, as I come to the conclusion uh, of uh, this, this brief talk, uh, my apologies for some of the technical glitches, but I'd like to thank you all for listening. I hope I've been able to uh, give you a, a taster of, of the subject. I hope I've been able to, to link the link between altruism and faith, and particularly with reference to Humanity First and the Amdiya Muslim uh, community. Uh, and with that, I'll hand over back to the studio. Jazakallah, Aziz Saheb, uh, for a very inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, we have a number of questions from our viewers, viewers uh, which I'll ask um, individually. Um, Wahida Ahmed uh, asks, uh, how do we give our children consolation over the suffering endured by the Yemeni people? I presume that you can extend that to other suffering as well. Um, so in what way can um, children especially be consoled when they uh, observe such suffering, especially on the news, for instance? And it's a, it's it's not an easy question that, that she asks, and uh, in my in my capacity as a humanitarian working for uh, Humanity First, uh, I, I, I will speak in that capacity. That yes, there are there is suffering in in many many parts of the world, and the crisis in some war torn countries is is very very extreme. How we console our children. Uh, 
again, I, I am not qualified to, to guide on that, but uh, as, as a layman, we all have children and we all try to put some things into perspective. And it's a very broad, broad subject, the subject of, of suffering. Uh, it can be looked at from a theological point of view, it can be looked at from a political point of view uh, and a geopolitical uh, point of view. Uh, there is, wherever there is suffering, on the other side, there is there is plenty of, of good works there. And I would, in my personal capacity, would suggest that we console our children by showing them the opportunities that they are for good, and the, the opportunities that they are for justice, and the opportunities to actually make a difference, to actually help that child that's suffering in that war-torn country to help that child that does not have education. Uh, and as we've alluded to earlier, not only in, in Islam and the India movement, but scientific journals are now talking about how altruism in itself is a means of solace and a means of comfort uh, for humanity. So uh, I, I hope that that gives some, some answer to, to a question. Uh, yes, that leads quite nice into the next question, actually, as you say. Um, Malik Faraz Ahmed, who's listening from Bradford, uh, pays uh, many compliments about the uh, the topic and the talk itself. His question is, uh, in what way uh, could you advise or guide that an altruistic personality in an individual can be beneficial uh, specifically for their uh, mental health? Okay, so... Uh, that is a very, very great question, and for those that have heard the keynote address by Professor Jeremy Howick on the Humanity First Thought Leadership webinars uh, this Saturday, you would have heard this, this very topic from a scientific point of view. You've already heard from the theological point of view uh, about altruism, how it is the basis of faith. It is the basis of the Islamic faith. But now scientific reasoning has shown that actually altruistic working and altruistic uh, uh, behavior is actually beneficial for your mental health. It lowers your blood pressure. There are varying studies that have been done uh, to promote uh, altruistic working and doing good for others as a means of improving your well-being. And this is very pertinent currently in the COVID crisis that we're facing across the world. Uh, and I would urge you to study the lectures of His Holiness, Hazrat Mizam Surah Ahmed Melabi's helper, where he speaks eloquently on altruism. And at the same time, also look at scientific sources uh, that I referred to earlier uh, to see how the language is there. Uh, the next question is from Tofiq Harji. Um, his question is, in the distribution of food parcels, what criteria is used to determine if somebody is genuine and destitute, as many people do purport to be in need? That's a very, very good question. And this question goes to the heart of humanitarian service uh, across the world. So in any operation, in any disaster relief operation, uh, there is, you start off with an assessment uh, to assess the situation. So you're assessing the, the disaster, you're assessing the, the impact of that disaster on, on, on the city, on the land, on the people. Uh, has it impacted food? Has it impacted supply chain? Has it impacted water? Uh, so these assessments are very important before you jump in. Uh, so you need to look at many, many sources. And once you've had a multifactorial look at all the varying sources of information and you come to a point that there is a community or a group of people that are actually in need of some service, be that food, be that water, uh, food in this case, uh, your assessment and data would then show you that uh, their food supplies have now been blocked, the supply chain has been destroyed, the road is no longer accessible. So you would use a whole host of varying data to ascertain and make a judgment on that. But you are absolutely right. Uh, there, there, there can be fraudulent use, uh, but as an NGO, 
uh, you are mandated to ensure that you do no harm and that you work with absolute justice and, and equity. Yeah? And that is done by using appropriate assessment tools, appropriate methodologies, and ensuring that you're getting feedback from a whole host of areas to ensure that what you do is equitable. Uh, next, uh, two questions are very similar, so I'll combine them into one. One of them is from Malik Takri Mahmud, um, who is also listening from Bradford. Um, his um, question is, um, how can Humanity First uh, and indeed any Jamaat volunteers always maintain an altruistic mindset when engaged in volunteering? Uh, and linked to that question uh, from Muhammad Dar, what is the reaction of the general public when the Jamaat or Humanity First does assist? Okay, so if I understood your question, the first is how to maintain that altruistic mindset and the reaction of members of the public. So maintaining an altruistic mindset, uh, again, I, I refer you back to His Holiness, who has spoken countless times about maintaining your attitude and maintaining the discipline with which you work and serve for others i.e. a selfless nature, ensuring that you put the interests of others before you put the interests of yourself. Uh, you've heard the quotations from his keynote epic address in 2015, uh, where he speaks on these, on these qualities. So I would refer you to that, and I would refer you to my earlier points that were raised in terms of how to maintain uh, those altruistic qualities. And in answer to your second question, in terms of the, the reaction from the members of the public across the world, I mean, naturally, uh, who would not uh, be pleased uh, when they're seeing humanitarian service being done, be that by Humanity First, be that by any other NGO, or be that by any other organization. But I'm personally witness to the huge amount of generosity and gratitude, and it's humbling that is experienced by the volunteers of Humanity First across the world, uh, because it can be seen the the, the effort that they, they they put in, the lengths that they that they go to uh, to reach uh, far off lands where access is sometimes takes days and days to reach. I hope I hope that answers this question. Thank you. Um, and another couple of questions which I'll combine into one. Um, Malik um, the Kareem Ahmed, sorry, my, I've got the, the name wrong. Uh, Shaimadar asks, uh, how do we explain to an atheist how important faith is for altruism, as many people who are charitable are also atheists? And Fami asks a similar question. Um, how would you uh, speak or respond to an atheist who say that you don't need to believe in God to be altruistic? So quite a philosophical question. Again, it is a philosophical question, and it's a question that uh, actually uh, is, is probably for another occasion, and, uh, and probably today's, today's talk uh, may not be appropriate to answer that. But there's, there's people of, of many faiths and people of, of no faith, and many, many people actually serve humanity, and you have seen earlier, I alluded to the studies that were done by Axelrod and Hamilton in the early 80s where people have found that actually when you study natural selection, when you study the theory of evolution, you can see that the altruistic gene, if you want to call it, uh, is actually beneficial uh, for human relations. And it's actually beneficial for the survival uh, of, of good characteristics. Uh, so without going into a very long theological, philosophical answer, uh, I would refer the questioner uh, to that paper uh, in 1981 uh, and I would also refer the questioner to some of the keynote addresses by His Holiness where the subject is dealt with uh, in, in great detail. Exactly. Uh, Azizab, uh, one final question. Um, there are many uh, viewers who are maybe interested in becoming involved in the work of Humanity First. Um, how would you advise that they go about uh, getting involved in, in, in the kind of projects that you're involved in yourself? 
So Humanity First is always on the lookout for volunteers across the world, north, east, south, and west. Uh, from a UK point of view, I would ask you to log on to www.hfuk.org. In terms of an international point of view, if you log on to www.humanityfirst.org, and from there, you will be able to be signposted to your national Humanity First websites. And from there, I would urge you to contact your relevant uh, Humanity Firsts on a national level. They will be more than happy uh, to help guide you in terms of the opportunities for volunteering and, and how you can help. And I must stress there are countless, countless opportunities. Uh, the, the need is huge. Zakala. Um, so as you said, uh, a very moving and motivational uh, presentation. Uh, it's obviously self-evident that the uh, of the unparalleled work that uh, continues to be done by Humanity First and their uh, many selfless volunteers. Uh, and you've obviously explained in quite a lot of detail how faith uh, has inspired them uh, to serve and sacrifice in the manner that they do for the sake of humanity. Uh, our thanks also to uh, the viewers uh, for tuning in. Uh, our lectures return next Monday when we will be joined by Abdul Wadud Khan Sahib, the president of Muhammad Jamaat, who will be speaking on the topic of apostasy in Islam. That lecture will be in Urdu. And then a week today on Tuesday, we will have an English lecture by Murabi al Salsala Burhan Ahmad Raja Sahib. The title of his talk will be The Importance of Reading the Books of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam. So please make sure that you join us for both of those lectures next week at the same time of 7.30 p.m. I will now pass over to respected National Secretary Dalim Education, Nadeem Rahman Sahib, uh, for any closing remarks. Jazakallah, I would just like to end by uh, giving my gratitude and uh, thanks to Dr. Aziz Ahmed Afi Saab for taking the time out and coming here to our studio. Allah bless you and all the Humanity First workers and volunteers around the world. Uh, and I will just end by asking and humbly requesting Dr. Aziz Afi Saab if he could lead us in silent okay, prayer. Thank you both and thank you to all the organizers. Uh, for granting the opportunity, if you'd like to join me in silent prayer. Amen. 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 Amen.